Time's up. Time's up, okay. <laughs> well, I have no watch, so I, time does fly for me sometimes when I'm teaching. <laughs> oh boy, well, let, let's, let's, uh, let's jump back in here. We are, um, we're continuing a lesson that uh, is going to be taking us through several very important topics, of, and, and it really centers on the gospel message and how now in the in the in the the coming of Christ, His redemptive work, uh, and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the inauguration of the new covenant, that we're living in an age when God is continuing to push back against the consequences of the fall in very real ways in our lives, and we're just focusing in on that in anticipation of what His final work will be when Jesus returns, and we've we've sort of come up with. Uh, uh, I've come up with like six categories. Uh, first of all, under uh, our present experience, we're considering the forgiveness of our sins. We have reconciliation with God. Sins are forgiven in the new covenant in a way that they were not forgiven before. This directly relates to the fall and to the consequences of sin. We have new spiritual life because we were spiritually dead. Uh, but in Christ, there is spiritual life that's not possible before, and it's especially reliant upon the work and the presence of the Holy Spirit. And I'm looking forward to talking about that at length together. We have a new community that this, this uh, not only we reconcile to God, but in Christ we become part of a reconciled community to one another. And, and you have that kind of fellowship and relationship that God had always intended for us to enjoy with other people that can be... Uh, brought about through the, the redemptive work of Jesus. And then, of course, our future hopes, the redemption of our bodies, our bodily resurrection, uh, that that which was lost in Eden and turned back to dust will be raised from the dust into a glorified body. Also, the renewal of creation at the return of Jesus with new heavens and new earth and all that our, in, our eternal inheritance uh, uh, implies, our, our eternity with God, uh, sharing in his glory. All of these future things to be brought about at the return of Jesus and the ultimate defeat and overthrow of Satan and the ushering in, in of, this, of this final age. We, we began focusing on the forgiveness of sins as the first of our experiences in the gospel where we are already now enjoying in a spiritual sense what Christ has already begun to do for us. And uh, we've looked at how forgiveness of sins is taught throughout the preaching in the book of Acts. It's just a part of the, of the, it's the, uh, part of the heart of the teaching. And then last week we began to look at a specific aspect of the forgiveness of sins, which is reconciliation. And we talked about the importance, as Paul, Paul talks about our being reconciled uh, in Christ, that being in Christ brings us into a, a new experience of blessings that could not be known before we could come into Christ through faith and in, in our baptism into him. And in, in 2 Corinthians 5, in terms of reconciliation, Paul says that God no longer counts our trespasses against us. And the way that he accomplishes this is by uh, causing Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin, so that we could become the righteousness of God. And so reconciliation, or being made friends again with God, is achieved by Jesus taking our sins upon himself. As Peter said in 1 Peter 2, that he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. So there's that, the implications in our lives, that, that Jesus takes our sins, and now we're set free uh, to live lives for him. Today, we come to a, we talked a bit last week about what this means for us. This is, these aren't just theoretical, abstract thoughts. Uh, this is why we can talk to God. This is why we have fellowship with God and have intimacy with him and can speak to him. And he knows our hearts and we know him. And uh, it's because we're reconciled. There, there is no barrier. As I mentioned last week, we don't have to hide in, in the bushes any longer. We don't have to point fingers anymore because God's dealt with this problem of our sins through Christ. And we, we wanna look at just a few other means uh, by which this forgiveness of sins is indicated in the, in, the, in the New Testament. And the next one we find in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. So if you open up to Ephesians 1, we'll 
start with a new section here. Do you know how uh, oh, let me put it this way. When we got when we bought our new car in uh, 2004, uh, it's, it's a Toyota Avalon. I think I'd seen a couple of Avalons, but then we did our research. We decided what kind of car we wanted to get. I wanted a lot of leg room in the back seat for my mom and dad and all sorts of things like this. And it got narrowed down pretty quick uh, for lots of back seat leg room. And so we ended up with a Toyota Avalon. Well, after we bought a Toyota Avalon, there were like, a million Toyota Avalons just all, all of a sudden just appeared on the street. You know, Dean Chapman got a Toyota. Oh, I, I've got an Avalon. I mean, it's just like you see them. Do you know what I mean? It's like once you have something in your head, you've never seen it before, and then all of a sudden it's everywhere. And you see it. I don't know. That happens to me a lot. It's happened to me a lot in this study, and I just want to kind of throw that out here at the beginning. Once you begin to look at the Word of God from this overarching theme of God taking care of the fall in, in Eden and bringing things new and this ultimate plan that he has, it's just amazing. Then when you go back and read the Bible, how it's everywhere. It's everywhere. And it, it's like once you, once you have that image in your head of, oh, yeah, this is what happened in Genesis 3. This is where God's taking us. This is how it's going along the way. It's just like it pops out in scriptures that you've known for years, it pops out in new and fresh ways. And, and I mention that because it happens here in, in Ephesians chapter 1. Now, we're looking at, at what, what verses 7 through 10, because it's going to talk about redemption, and we want to zero in on redemption. But I, I've just got to, let me just go back and just quickly just read through without discussing 3 through 6. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ, remember that from last week, in Christ. He has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the Beloved. This eternal plan of God, it's been, it's been set for so long. And now we will continue in that in 7 through 10. Again, in him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. Now, we're going to we'll eventually get to the end of the passage, but we're, we're really kind of focused on the first part of this. And Paul again talks about this blessing that we find in Christ. And in verse 7, he specifies one particular blessing. Uh, at, the, at the beginning of that verse, a particular blessing that we have because we're in Christ. And what is that? Forgiveness of sin. Okay, forgiveness of sins, and the, and the precursor to that is redemption. redemption. And, and then that's, that's defined. Well, it's the forgiveness of sins. So we're here, we're talking about forgiveness of sins, but in a particular way, uh, Paul brings up this word redemption. So what does redemption mean? Just generally speaking, what does redemption mean? What are some ideas associated with redemption? Robin? Okay, you're buying back something. Uh, and um, Robin mentions the prophet Hosea, his wife Gomer, who went into prostitution, and he buys her back for himself. He redeems her. Any other, any other thoughts on, uh, on redemption? Just any other aspect of it? Yeah, a, a ransom is another another word that really fits well with that. It, absolutely, uh, it's to be bought, to be purchased, to be ransomed, and typically from some kind of captivity. 
Um, I mean, you could think you could use. I mean, we think of ransom with kidnapping, but you could use the word redeem in a sense. They're slightly different words, but they're in the same general ballpark. But it means that this is somebody who's in a situation that they can't get themselves out of. They can't extricate themselves out of. They need to be redeemed. They need to be ransomed. They need to be. They need to be rescued. And since this redemption uh, seems to be, or not seems to be, but is directly, as Mike points out, tied to the forgiveness of our sins. What kind of enslavement does Paul seem to have in mind here? What's that? Spiritual. Yeah, our spiritual, our, our spiritual enslavement. We're in bondage to sin. We're slaves under sin. How are you going to get? How are you going to get out of that? You, you and I, because of sin and because of Satan's control in our life pre-Christ, are uh, are sold under sin. We're we're slaves to sin. How do you and I break that? We don't. We can't. We need to be redeemed. We need somebody who can do something for us to get us out of the mess that we're in because we're not capable of, of engineering our own escape. And so uh, here, of course, we I mean, it's pretty clear, isn't it, in the verse, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our sins. Uh, the forgiveness of our trespasses so that again the the forgiveness the redemption is tied to the blood of Jesus that's his sacrifice uh, and, and notice how often in this text and of course throughout Ephesians but Paul talks about grace you think about Gomer who was unfaithful to her husband and goes into prostitution and her husband buys her back that's grace <laughs> We have been sold into sin by, by, not by, I mean, we have gone into slavery and, and God buys us back. And, and somehow this spiritual transaction, this ransom of sorts, uh, is dependent upon the blood of Jesus uh, to bring about our rescue. And, uh, and we're rescued from spiritual slavery. I mean, the, the, uh, What's probably the greatest act of redemption in the Old Testament, for, as far as God's people are concerned? Egypt. Yeah, Egypt. That's the one. How, how often do the prophets say, remember when the Lord brought you up out of the land of Egypt? That's like the moment. It's like when God brought Israel up out of slavery, that proved who God was, that proved his love for them, his power, and he redeemed them. He redeemed them from bondage to Egypt. He brought them into freedom. And so these, this is the kind of imagery that we should have uh, when we think about, uh, about redemption. So what does that mean for you and me? What is it? It's a nice word. It's a great metaphor. Oh, yeah, like they were. And like, yeah, okay, I get it. I've been bought. I've been, what does it mean? Practically speaking, what are we talking about here? What does it mean to be redeemed? What, how, is that any, how, how is your life any different? I mean, in a practical sense, because you've been redeemed by the blood of Christ. Because otherwise, it's just this abstract thought. And we're going to have a few more abstract thoughts as this lesson goes on. And that, doesn't, that frankly doesn't help us a whole lot if it doesn't. And we talked about reconciliation last week and how practically we experience reconciliation with God and have that communion with him. And that, that, you know, the enmity is gone. We're, we're re well, what, what happens in our minds and our lives when it, when it, uh, where redemption is concerned? Any thoughts about that? We are, uh, have access to the gift of life that we wouldn't have without. Okay, we have access to the gift of life that we wouldn't have before. Okay, that's a good point. Alan, do you have? Well, I was going to say, I don't even know if this is right. I kind of, you know, I was at a point in my life where I was in bond. I was redeemed. Now that I have been accepted by Christ, I'm a different person than I was before. I don't seek to. So I don't. I don't know exactly what I'm trying to say here. Well, I, I know why you're struggling with it because. The sermon today is going to talk uh, is like centers on what you're just talking about, and I've I've had trouble kind of coming up with ways of talking about this, but I know I think I know exactly what you mean. Uh, is that there is a sense in which we are no longer sold under sin, 
Do you live under the captivity of sin? No, you don't. Now, that, and that doesn't mean we, we aren't human, we don't struggle, but there is a difference. And you were saying everything was down. There was no hope. Everything was down. There was no escape. But you've been delivered from that. You have a different view of life now. You're no longer, you're no longer looking at your life and saying, well, I just can't break this cycle. I'm just stuck here. I'll never be free from my baser instincts and all my failures. And when, when, when redemption, when we embrace that as a reality, and, and, and it's, I think and herein lies the problem because we know we still struggle, but we don't struggle as people who are captives. We struggle as people who are free. And I, uh, sorry, this is, you can, you can skip the sermon this morning. You guys get to go home early. <laughs> but, but that, I mean, it's so weird how thing, it just intersects this week because I'm doing my assignment from Story of Redemption and it's Romans 6 and we're free from sin. So you're going to hear it again. But we are free from sin in this sense and, and we're, we've been redeemed. And we'll, we will talk about that a little bit more. But Satan does not hold me in his clutches anymore. No, no. I have a different story. I have a different reality. I, I still have I still have to fight, but it's not. I'm not fighting. I'm not a slave to sin anymore. I'm not tied up in those chains. Those chains have been broken by Christ. He paid the price, and I may still struggle, but not as one who doesn't share in the victory of Christ. And it's a it's the, these things that that we often sometimes name theologically. Uh, I say we, I, uh, I sometimes fail to really think them through and, and, and think about what does that actually mean in my life that, that, that I'm no longer a slave to sin, that I'm not, that I'm not in bondage. So anyway, that's... Uh, we have the gift uh, yeah. of the Spirit. Yeah, we have the gift of the Spirit, which is the, uh, the, the life changer. And uh, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about that in the, the second part when we get to the, the new spiritual life that we have uh, in Christ. But, yeah, go ahead. One thing that has kind of troubled me from time to time <laughs> is that we know we've all sinned. We have godly sorrow. We ask God to forgive us. And I seem to think that sometimes he doesn't hear me, so i got to tell him over and over this whole thing sure. that please forgive me, please forgive me, extend your mercy, except sure. Does, am I the only one, or it's? I would say no. I see a couple of heads shaking. No, and I, I think I, I understand I, his power. Okay? Right. And so, why do I keep going back for the same thing? We keep but, sinning. <laughs> well, I, you know, we don't stop then we're still sinners yeah. I, think a couple, I think there are a couple of things that are at work one that's positive and one that's negative one is that if you're a Christian who wants to be free from sin when you stumble and fall into it you have deep regret and shame right. and a sense of failure <clears throat> that, 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 that's, I mean, the, that's the conviction of the Holy Spirit yeah. uh, so that's a good thing the, the bad part of it is we're very well aware that by one of his names and titles that Satan is an adversary who is continually bringing charges, who is continually telling you what a louse you are, what a failure you are, how you never measure up, how you will never be free, how you just think. Satan, and, and to me, we have, there's a fine line between those because on the one, the one is is a spiritually healthy thing. The other one is is that's that's taking us back into enslavement, and you know your adversary, the devil. I mean, he's he's the one who brings charges. He wants he wants to he wants us, even though we've been set free, to feel like we're not. And and I think that we have to. I think we have to work to have the spiritual discernment to see how those things are different in our lives and to reject the one. the 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 one leads us to repentance, and that and then after that. What that should lead us to is thanksgiving and gratitude for forgiveness, not to a continual reminder of sin. And, and again, it's just a fine line. It's one of those things that at some point it becomes a negative thing. You know, I mean, if, if a person's living, oh, man, I hope, well, 
there's so many wrong ideas of salvation. Ooh, I sinned last night at 10. I died at 10, 15. I forgot to pray. I'm going to hell because I've got a sin on my record. Yeah, that's just like a totally, yeah, that's just wrong. <laughs> that's just, that's so totally works oriented righteousness. Just, you got to throw that out. There's no condemnation if you're in Christ Jesus. We live knowing that we're saved. Yes, we stumble and fall, but we do have regret. And by the grace of God, we have forgiveness. And, uh, and, and so we, I think for each of us individually, it's just a matter of being aware of that. And I, I'd say if, I'll say that the time that this is most likely to happen to me, and, and, and probably, for, maybe this is, way, uh, I'll just leave it at that. Maybe for you, I don't know if it's for you too, but it's like typically for me is if it's something that I have, I've perpetually have a difficulty with and pledge that I will bring this to an end and then fall. Even if it's a year later, it's like I told God, you know, it's like I, I made that, I made that commitment and I'm not, I'm not talking about making foolish vows, but it's like you really, and, and, and that, that lingers to me more than if something just like something like random <laughs> happens, if you know. Like I say something and I realize, well, that was hurtful. I shouldn't have done that. That's a lot easier for me to sense the forgiveness than something that is a is a battleground in my life. But I think we you gotta get to the we've got to live in forgiveness and in grace, or we're just I mean, or if we don't, we're enslaved. We, we're not actually enslaved, but we're living like we are. And uh, I'll share an interesting story today about that in the sermon. <laughs> Mike, sorry, just kidding. <laughs> One thing that we can count on, Satan is consistent. And he will constantly attack us, our faith, in that too often as Christians, we hear people say, you ask them if they're saved, and they I think so, I hope so. And so they, we need to constantly yeah. be aware that we are. Yes. God paid that price. Yes. And there should be no should, doubt. The power, and that, and that, and the one I, I and I'll just make this really brief. But if the answer is, I hope I've done enough, then what, when I've heard that, I've just told the person, you haven't. I mean, I'll just, I'll just be blunt. If you say this to me, are you going to, well, I hope, I, you know, I just hope I've been good enough. Or I hope, I, I just hope I've been good enough. Okay. If you think that's how you're getting in, <laughs> you got a problem. I mean, I got some good news for you. <laughs> I got some bad news for you. You're not good enough and you'll never do enough and you'll never be there. You, you can never say, yeah, I deserve that. No, if you think that's how it works, you've misunderstood the whole thing. So get that out of your head, and then if you say that, now you're doubting the power of the blood of Jesus and the grace of God, and that's that's kind of dangerous territory. If the death of Jesus isn't enough to save me from my sins, well, that's a pretty arrogant thing for me to think. Like I've got some, like I can add to that. So that's just a whole other thing. Don't ever say that to me unless you want the lecture. <laughs> now, I, some dear people in my life who have gone on some close relatives who just, it was so hard for them to shake that idea. And I just, it broke my heart that they had trouble shaking that idea because it just left that kind of <laughs> nagging thing. Is that 9.30? 9.30. Whoa, okay. I thought it was, I thought it was one of those silver alerts. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. So let's press along. Uh, the, the next couple of passages, we're going to, a little more quickly, because they all, they, they deal with the same, the same uh, aspect of forgiveness. Colossians, oh, I have to say, did you notice verse 10? Sorry, I got to go back real quickly. <laughs> According to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. When you're thinking about God's overall plan, that little phrase jumps out and you go, okay, what's that talking about? What is that? How Jesus is coming back and he's uniting all things in him, all things in heaven. All th that sounds like something massive going to happen when Jesus returns. We're, that's, that's getting us to the end, but you see how that it's just there. 
This kind of stuff is all over the Bible where we're going, we're jumping down to the end. Colossians 1, sorry. 13, I didn't want to miss that verse because I just, I just popped out at me a couple of weeks ago and I thought, whoa. Right at the end of a, you know, Colossians and Ephesians, um, part of the prison epistles, parallel in so many ways, and yet one takes it, Ephesians, really an emphasis on God's eternal purpose in the church, and Colossians, a real emphasis on the superiority of Christ. And so the very similar things Paul's saying in these two letters, but from slightly different perspectives. And so he, he's kind of done the same thing at the beginning of Colossians that he does at Ephesians. We're just going to jump to the end in this case and look at 13 and 14, because he's talking about all these blessings that we have in Christ. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And there it is again. We have redemption in Christ. This is the forgiveness of our sins. And, and what this passage adds, and the reason I put it in, is that uh, it, Paul describes a little bit of this redemptive process. What, what, how does he describe how we've been redeemed? Or I know it's by the blood of Jesus Christ, but uh, what we've been redeemed from. I mean, it's, a, it's kind of... The power of darkness. Yeah, it's right there on the screen. He delivered us. Do you know what you were enslaved to? You were enslaved to the power of darkness. You were in the kingdom of darkness. You and I were under the domain of the evil one. We were in darkness. But what happened? He transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son. And how did he do that? How did we go from being under the domain, under the reign, under the rule of sin and darkness, and into a kingdom of light? We, we were redeemed. We were purchased. We were bought. We were ransomed so that we could be put where God wanted to put us. And, uh, and that's, that's what he does for us in Christ. That's, that's that blessing of redemption. We've been delivered. We've, been, we've moved from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of light, the kingdom of his beloved son. Alan, maybe that's what you and I are kind of trying to say. We were in the domain of darkness. There, there's an oppressive thing. There's a failure there. There's, a, there's no hope. But now, not that our struggles are all over, but we, we're in a new environment. We're in the kingdom of his son. We have a very different perspective about our temptations now uh, than we did. And... Um, at the risk of going down something uh, that we don't have time for. In Romans 7, when Paul talks about his struggle against the flesh, then he talks about how he, you know, I do the very things I don't want to do. You know that, that, that whole thing? At the end of that, what does he say? Thanks be to God who has delivered us through Christ Jesus our Lord. It's like, yeah, he still has the struggle, but he's no longer stuck in that cycle of sin and death. And uh, that's, I think that's our experience in Christ. Look how quickly we did that. Go on to Titus. Titus chapter 2. Verses 11 to 14. For the grace of God has appeared. Notice again grace. All of these passages start with grace. If there's no grace, if there's no impulse of grace... There's no redemption. There's no forgiveness. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness, and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. So again, we have grace, we have redemption, uh, a purification. But the question I would ask on this passage is how should, in this text, how should experiencing God's grace, how should experience the redemption that we have through Jesus Christ, how should it impact our lives? How should it change us according to this text? To be zealous for good works. That's one of the things that, that ought to happen. 
if God has redeemed you and, and has redeemed you from all your lawlessness, you ought to now be zealous for him and zealous to do good things, zealous to do good works. What else? Take a look at verse 12. Training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. If you and I, if we've been redeemed, we ought to be motivated, having been set free, to say, I'm done with this. I renounce darkness. I renounce sin. I don't want anything to do with it again. And, and, and to be undergo training for that in, in our spiritual growth, to, to, to turn away from all worldly passion and to be determined that we're going to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives. If you've been, re you know, you think, you think about someone who's been, well, the metaphor falls short because people who go to prison have all sorts of things in their, in their future that they, they struggle with. But, I mean, if you get set free, I mean, in our situation, the last thing we want to do is go back inside. We don't want to go back. We don't want to go back under Satan's control. And the way for us to to uh, to live in such a way where that isn't going to happen is to denounce these things, to renounce ungodliness, to live self-controlled and upright lives, to live godly lives. We've been purified. This whole redemption by the blood of Jesus is to purify us. It's to transfer us into this kingdom. So we should live as people who've been transferred into that kingdom and renounce sin and. Uh, uh, and live a holy life. And notice again that further motivation for this is Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back, waiting for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. So we're waiting. We're waiting for Jesus to return, uh, and that's that's further motivation. So our redemption, uh, our forgiveness of sins, uh, leads us to holiness, to live a pure life. If you go back to the, the earlier passages dealing with reconciliation, both Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5 and 1 Peter 2, they both end with a call for righteousness. And uh, uh, since my timepiece is getting up and walking out, it must be over. No. So no, I think it probably is. Is it, is it 9.30? I need a clock check. You have, you have 9.30. Oh, it is 9.30. It's, yeah, it's 9.45. Okay. So again, okay, good. We, we are now moving. So point made, let's go on to our, we'll get down to Romans for our next class, which is uh, a good place to leave it today. Hebrews 9, 11 through 14. All righty. We know a lot about Hebrews. It has a lot to say about the superiority of Jesus, of the new covenant, the superiority of his blood over the blood of the, of the sacrificial system. And, uh, and then we just look at this. I mean, out of the whole book, we're just going to jump in and read these four verses in Hebrews chapter 9, 11 to 14. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation. He entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Here again, we're just told about the sacrifice of Jesus. He doesn't go into the tabernacle. The tabernacle is just a copy of the spiritual realities in the heavenly realms. Jesus enters heaven itself. He goes into the very holy of holies, into the presence of God, not with the animals the blood of animals, but with his own blood. And there he offers his own blood on our behalf to bring about the purification. Uh, he offers himself without blemish, and he does so to purify our consciences from dead works to serve the living God. Notice that the writer of Hebrews calls this eternal redemption. 
Our redemption is eternal in its nature. It reaches into the heavenly realms. It's eternal. We've been cleansed. We've been forgiven. Our consciences are purified. And that's going back to what Rod was talking about earlier. Our consciences now are purified. The blood of Christ has taken them out of the way, and we're motivated once again to serve the living God. Don't miss that last little phrase here. All of this is done so that you and I will have greater motive to serve the living God. And that's what redemption leads us to do, to thank God for our forgiveness, to understand that where we were and where he's brought us, the cost of that redemption and what that means for us now, not to live under, uh, under the, uh, the, the hold of Satan and, and sin's power and death. Uh, when, you th when you think about this as it relates to life before Christ, you see that we're in a very different place. We're in a very different place. Now, Israel, can, Israel can have redemption through the same blood of Jesus, not through the blood of bulls and goats. The difference is that Israel was unaware of, of that coming redemption that you and I accept and, and that we, we go to the cross and we see what God's done and now we live in the spiritual reality of being transferred and no longer under the control of sin, that we're set free and we're redeemed. Um, we're forgiven of our sins. We're reconciled to God. We're redeemed. We're bought. We're ransomed. These last, I think there's just two scriptures left. If I recall on your handout, I believe it should just be Romans 3 and Romans 5. I think 1 Peter's there, but we've already done it. In our next class, we're going to be looking at these two passages. Romans 3, 21 through 26 has been called one of the most theologically dense paragraphs in all of scripture. I didn't say that, but somebody did. I don't remember who, but somebody did because I remember it. But take a look at, take a look at that verse. You talk about packing it all. Packing so much into six verses and then trying to unpack it, it's Romans 3. And then we're going to end by showing that all of this ties directly in to Genesis 3. Because in Romans 5, what Paul's going to tell, he's going to take us back to Adam. And he's going to tell us that in Adam, we all die. But in Christ, we all live. Christ is the one who turns the tables on Genesis 3. He's the seed of woman who comes to do his work. And, and so we'll, we'll, with those two passages, we'll finish up the uh, forgiveness of sins, and then we'll move to the next section of our class, which is our new spiritual life. So thank you all so much. Thank you.